Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome back. So, we will be now starting with the new topic. So, so far we have discussed uh, with the different types of models in macro, but now we will be found, uh, formally introducing ourselves into the core area of uh, macroeconomics, where we will be not just discussing about the macroeconomic phenomena. So, maybe the output decline, interest rate rise, price increase, price decrease, how it is impacting the monetary policy, how monetary policy is impacting the fiscal policy. Those dimensions we have covered already and I think I hope all of you are aware about how we have at least understood the idea behind the macroeconomic phenomenon that we should be studying. But in this particular session we will be looking beyond the conventional macro. We will be also trying to see the interaction among different schools of economic thought. So, I have already mentioned about the macroeconomic schools different types. So, here you are already aware about the neoclassical and then you have. So, we started with, with classicals which believed in flexible wages and prices. Then we moved to the Keynesian school of economic thought. In Keynesian school of economic thought, we have already found that there is a role of the government. So, Keynesian school of economic thought emphasize on the short term characteristics of the economy, where they emphasize on the role of fiscal policy, how government intervention can bring macroeconomic stabilization or can ensure macroeconomic stabilization. And then once you have the macroeconomic stabilization taking place, then the uh, interaction of monetary policy, um, uh, uh, interaction of monetary policy can be introduced into the model. Now, Given this background, we also looked at that uh, particular school of economic thought, which talked about uh, having both Keynesian and classical dimension in the short run and long run context. And they tried to look at that how we can incorporate these two schools of economic thought. Basically, the Keynesian, which I mentioned about the government, but I forgot to mention that Keynesians also believed in non-flexible wages and prices which, which also it is called sticky wages and prices. According to them in the short term it is very difficult to have a quick adjustment or quick adjustment into the equilibrium wages and the prices and because of that reason they emphasize more on the staggered prices or maybe you can say about the sticky prices where the we do not find a quick flexible uh, or we do not find flexible wages and prices. Now, looking beyond this, what neoclassical of economic school of thought recommended that can we have a, some kind of coherence between the, these two rigid school of economic thought, thought. So, they focused on understanding the behavior of the, the macroeconomic agents in the context of rational expectations or also in the context of microeconomic foundations with we have already examined in the context of one period model, two period model. So, that is the idea and then we had the new classicals and then we have the I would say new Keynesians those who believe in that we introduce the idea of what we call it as the we call it as fresh water and salt water belonging. So, so fresh water belongs to the new classicals and then you have the fresh water coming from the Keynesian. Now, with this background, I hope it is clear that what are we going to talk about. So, now we will be looking at the neoclassical schools, school of macroeconomics, where they emphasize that it is not just the government policy. There are uh, avenues through which we can understand the stabilization process in the economy. So, for the first time, uh, we have we had under 
gone through understanding the business cycle dynamics from the supply side perspective. If I am saying about the business cycle dynamics from supply side perspective, then it implies that how with certain changes in the behavioral uh, pattern of either the top management of the company or maybe the good technology, good weather, uh, good I would say or very suitable innovation, all these things contribute to the productivity. I would say productivity of capital becomes critical. So, in this particular session, we will try to understand that and for those people who are not aware about the business cycle. So, business cycle phenomena, uh, business cycle is a phenomena under which we try to study different phases of business, uh, different phases of the macro economy, wherein we say that when economy is achieving high growth rate. So, we say that economy is an expansion phase. When economy is going or having the uh, or it's, it is exhibiting uh, some kind of downward trend in its GDP, then we say that economy is on downward trend. So, that we uh, call, call it as the contraction. So, expansion and contraction and then you have the you have the slowdown and recovery phases that we call it a peak. Uh, so, normally expansion and contraction it is also in the language of business cycle it is called peak and trough, but uh, recovery and slowdowns are also the phases through which we try to understand the macroeconomic phenomena. So, so far what conventional business cycle school of economic thought believes that the business cycle dynamics are more linked with the demand side factors. So, what we have already understood y is equal to c plus i plus g plus n minus x. But for the first time the new school of economic thought tried to add dimension into the business cycle theory by introducing the concept what we what we call it with the supply side factors. How demand and supply of labor, how equilibrium in the labor market can play instrumental role in understanding the macroeconomic picture when it is aligned with the productivity shock. So, when we have a shock into the system either it is positive or negative normally it is considered that when you have productivity shock it is bound to be positive which means that it is creating avenues for the researchers, it is avenues for the consumers to have better income, better wealth, consumption in the current and future. There is a role of anticipation, there is a role of uh, expectation. So, we will be talking about that. So, let us start. So, I hope this background will help you understand the, the particular chapter in a, uh, in a better way. So, uh, we are following the same here we have the Stephen D. Williamson here the book remains same the macroeconomics and here we, we try to understand the key learning objective that I mentioned that it tries to explain you about the real business cycle model and it also tries to explain that how we can analyze the real business cycle dynamics when we try to bring changes. So, maybe you can say comparative statics that how we can deal with how the real business cycle model could be consistent with the observed co moment of money and output. Discuss criticism of the real business cycle model. We will be talking about certain I would say drawbacks or shortcomings. So, let us start. So, first we are talk, going to talk about the monetarist and Keynesians. So, once I talk about monetarist and Keynesians, then you must be having an idea that once I talk about monetarist, then it talks about the dominant role of monetary policy in the economy and they believe that monetary policy brings stability uh, in the economy and though in the, in the very short run it may not be very impactful, but yes it creates stability in the economy and one of the major roles of the monetary policy is about the price stabilization. So, that they mentioned. Then here you have the monetaries argued that it is the monetary policy that can stabilize the economy. Keynesian argued in favor of the fiscal policy which they believe that the role of the government is important. So, this was the 1960s era when monetarists and Keynesians were having good interaction on the dominance of their schools of economic thought policies. So, that was the clear case here. By 1970s when we had the invention or I would say introduction of rational expectations. So, once the 
individuals or the economists have started talking about the role of rational expectation in macroeconomic formulation with what we have mentioned about the policy ineffectiveness proposition that is directly linked with the Lucas critic. So, at that time the economist uh, that were lead the, the economist uh, those who were leading this particular argument or new dimension where Robert Lucas, then you have the Thomas Sargent, then you had the Neil Wallace and then you have the Robert Barrow. Barrow. So, these economists had, so here you have a T missing and here also you have the T missing. So, Robert Lucas, Thomas Sargent, they were more in favor of macroeconomic principles of the economy. Uh, what do you mean by microeconomics? So, this is what this course is trying to understand the new classical perspective that you can introduce the microeconomic dimensions about utility, about production function, about market, about forms and about the endowments, technology and then you can try to optimize consumers and form and arrive at the macroeconomic implications of these optimization tools. Now, that uh, that about the area in the field of macroeconomics that we call it as uh, it is linked with the general equilibrium models and with further advancement in uh, the tools and techniques. Now, we have something called the dynamic system of general equilibrium. So, that we call it as the DSG model uh, and if you try to analyze the shock into the general equilibrium model. So, it becomes dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model we, and we try to work out with the large set of agents we try to define in the same manner in the new classical way what we call it as the consumer forms endowments technology. So, all these play a very important role. They also emphasized on the macroeconomic modeling with classical framework. So, new classical they emphasize that in order to understand the long run characteristics of the economy, it is always good to talk about the flexible wages and prices and how we can think about the, the classical framework. So, I hope these two uh, lines are important and these two lines are also directly linked with the course uh, that we are, uh, we are doing. So, microeconomic foundation. So, this is how they try to understand. So, in recent literature if you go through and read about the macroeconomic dimensions then you will find that the dynamic stochastic general equilibrium based models. So, DSG based models are quite popular in the literature in recent studies if you read go through or if you browse through the journals uh, on macroeconomic topics then you find that the theoretical foundations are playing very important role and these theoretical foundations are are critical for the way the I would say not just the understanding of the macroeconomic phenomena, but also about the predictions. So, sometime we also try to see. So, if you want those of you who are interested in understanding further or extending this idea further or looking for uh, new developments, you should read journal of, of monetary economics. So, there you find lot of these models talking about. By 1980s, we found that it, there are widespread acceptance of this particular school of economic thought and people started real, uh, relying more on these mathematical models and then it became quite evident that even the role of government will be easier to understand in this setup. So, in order to understand that how the new classical school of economic thought contributed to the real business cycle, it starts from here. Now, let us deal with the real business cycle theory. During 1980s or I would say early 1980s, Finn Kidland and Edward Prescott, they had given this idea that the Bene cycle theory can be understood not only from the perspective of, of uh, demand side, but there should be a supply side perspective also to explain this phenomenon. So, they added this dimension. So, their basic question was that whether or not a standard model of economic growth subjected to random productivity shock. So, when I say about random productivity shock, then normally we in, in, the, in the long run growth theories 
that we have what we call it as the solo residuals which means that it is just the total output uh, our aggregate output divided by the inputs with the given elasticities how much you are getting and how much is the residual output that you have. So, this productivity shock comes from there and it becomes really important to see how we can analyze. So, can a random productivity shock replicate qualitatively and quantitatively understanding about and, and can it help understand the business cycle. So, that was the idea behind Kidland and Prescott and these two gentlemen are known for at this particular contribution and if you want to go through about the, the further dynamics of the real business cycle, more mathematical treatment, you can refer their paper that appeared in 1980s and then you can also have a look at their basic foundations. I have tried to simplify and I have followed uh, the book of Williamson to give you the basic framework how we can understand this in a better way. So, here they explain that the business cycle, the total factor productivity shock plays very important role in determining the business cycle phases. So, what are the factors that play that explains the or I would say what are the factors that explain the uh, total factor productivity. It includes good weather, then you have a technological innovation. So, maybe you have the startup culture, you have a new firms coming, collaborating, innovating, you have a lot of emphasis on innovations, government, a government is, is putting effort to bring new innovations into mainstream easing of government regulation, uh, regulations or so maybe you uh, are not allowing the technology import, but if government goes for revision of those policies, then it helps the firms to import more. Decreases in the relative, uh, I would say price of energy, so anything that benefits the production process. So, maybe you can think about earlier uh, labors were doing the manual jobs for creating output, so they might be producing 100 uh, units of output, but now because of this productivity shock, they are able to produce 1000 units of output. So, that could be that there is new machinery, new technology, so marginal productivity of capital has also gone up, right. So, once you have the productivity increase, so if you remember your one period model in that we had discussed about this comparative statics, where we mentioned about that if a productivity shock increasing, it is good for the labor also, because labor also sees increase in income and there is a further uh, increase in consumption, right. So, that is what and, and this also creates opportunity for the labor for mark uh, uh, to work for more number of hours. Demand for labor also increases because once you have the major product of labor getting higher, firms are inclined to hire more. Now, in this setup, when they define about the business cycle explanation, they do not explain or they do not uh, go for any kind of government intervention. So, that is the idea behind that here they focus only on the monetary policy that if you have monetary policy with the same assumption that the money supply is neutral. So, that argument they take it forward and then they walk out with certain data sets and they find that whatever prediction they had it fits well with the data. So, that is what. So, whether uh, the when you have productivity shock, so whether the investment, consumption, so y is equal to c plus i plus g, wages, prices, all these are pro cyclical or counter cyclical. Pro cyclical in the sense that if a money supply increase, one or two variables are increasing, showing the increasing trend, trend or direct relationship, but rest of the variables are showing inverse relationship. So, that we call it as the pro cyclical, counter cyclical. So, this is how we try and understand. Counter cyclical, it is also linked with the uh, with the fiscal policy when you have or monetary policy when you have slowdown in the economy, you pump up more. So, that also shows the inverse that your GDP is going down, you are augmenting the expenditure you are augmenting the money supply. So, once you have augmentation of these two variables, then it creates a scenario of what we call it as the, the, the pro cyclical or the counter cyclical. So, those arguments are also added here. So, here you have the simple descriptions of solo residual and this is the GDP. So, you can see that since this is this was the main motivation 
of the uh, real business cycle school of economic thought how they had gone for. So, what they mentioned that you will find uh, uh, some kind of coherence or a uh, very small deviation between GDP which is output and the solo residual because solo residual which means that with the change of capital and labor or whatever input technology that you are using, you are able to at least decide about how much output you can have. So, this shows about. So, the movement that we have here with regard to solar residual and the GDP, it reflects the same. You can also see the period that we have the, uh, the y axis and it, it speaks in volume about the role of inputs in driving the output. So, this is the idea behind this. Now, let us explain the business cycle model first and in business cycle model it becomes really important to see that how the model works in real, real life. So, the idea is simple that when we see increase in productivity when total productivity increases what do we see immediately? Immediately we will see that there will be demand for labor shifting rightward because you firms are quite uh, enthusiast about the production process, about the outlook, they are optimistic and given that the because of the employment capital the productivity of labor has gone up. So, they do not mind hiring more labor. So, this is how it looks like. What typically happens that because of this shift that we have rightward this shift leads to a rise in wages because if your demand for labor increasing you have a supply of labor will also increase because labor will be looking for employment right. From such theory also you can say the labor market tightness will increase which means that you have more matching taking place. So, if you have that kind of situation then here you have a WT, W2 rising. So, once you have W2 going up so which means that wage rate increases. And this wage rate increase is accompanied by the labor supply increase. So, this part is clear. Okay, so, let us focus on only N1D and N2D. Now, we are talking about here. So, once you have the production process increasing, right, you have more employment of labor, labor is producing output. So, which also means that your output supply will increase. So, this is how it is leading. So, here you have a Y1S and Y2S. So, rightward shift of the, ag the output supply it is leading to what? It is leading to earlier we were at R1, now we are at R2 and this creates a scenario wherein the rate of interest is lower, your output is increasing. Now, this rate of interest lower is also having two types of implications. So, one implication that we have to understand with regard to wage and labor. I am saying that demand is shifting up, it means that the labor is also having some anticipation. Anticipation in the sense that they are thinking in terms of the intertemporal aspects that if the productivity is going up, it is bound to increase the current income higher and in the future income is also going to be higher because wage rate is going to increase. So, once productivity is going high, it is creating a some kind of favorable scenario for the labor because labor expects that now they will have better standard of living right. This we had also seen in case of one period model. In this case once you have the, the rate of interest lower then and uh, uh, since the productivity has gone up. So, firm, is, uh, firm also does not bother about how much they have to in invest. So, even when you have the rate of interest lower this incentivizes the firm to go for more investments which means that investment also become pro cyclical. Here we are saying about the consumption, consumption also become pro cyclical because the labor is expecting that the current and future income will go up. So, as a result the consumption will also go up. So, that we have made. Now, we have also made about the investment. Now, one of the reasons that you have to understand that uh, if the rate of growth of productivity if it is not same. So, in this period here you have the increase in productivity right. So, if you have increase in productivity and if the increase in productivity suppose in this period it has increased by 100 
in next period it is increasing by just 50. So, you have to have a decreasing. So, if the rate of growth is not same, then the anticipation about the future will also be compromised. So, what will happen that the labor will also think about that whether they have to go for uh, more of consumption in the current period or in the future period. So, there will be confusion, but since rate of interest is lower, this, this representative consumer will think about the current consumption or maybe, uh, maybe he will be thinking about the future consumption. So, current and future consumption scenarios may not be as smooth as we are seeing. So, because of that there will be a leftover shift of the labor supply and this is directly linked with the interest rate that you have. So, once you have the interest rate lower then you tend to tend to think about that yes uh, you have to you have to uh, you have to think about the labor supply. So, labor supply is moving left and this is how it is linked with the how the anticipation plays very important role. So, in the beginning I mentioned about rational expectation, rational expectation plays very important role here. So, here we have a 1, 2 clear. Now, about 3 once we have the money supply fixed and once you have the low interest rate this will further create the scenarios, but since the role of the central bank is to maintain the price stability. So, uh, they will be simply going for increasing the money supply which further will increase the, the, the demand for money. So, more or less price will not be the same, price will decrease. So, once we have the demand for money shifting, so PLY1, R1, so it is coming from the previous lecture where we drive the demand for money. There we are seeing that with given money supply it is fixed and it is reducing. So, which means that with the productivity shock the role of anticipation becomes very important. So, in the beginning when the labor was quite enthusiastic about these things, consumption became pro-cyclical, investment became pro-cyclical because you have the uh, rate of interest lower. The demand for money supply also increased and this money supply increase has uh, impact on the, on the prices also because then you have the role of anticipation playing important role. Now, this anticipation uh, uh, role is critical to understand the real business cycle dynamics. But overall the understanding is that with the productivity shock, the labor market reacts in the same way, output reacts in the same way, the rate of interest also react in the same way. So, all have the pro cyclical characteristics and this is what we try to drive. Now, overall with regard to, uh, to productivity, I would say production function, here we are at A to B and here you will find that once we have the productivity shock, so this leads to better output production, right. Once you have better output production, you will find that slope of A to B, it become more steeper, which means that here this is leading to more of increase in output, but given the proportion of increase in output, we are not seeing that much increase in input, but it is increasing, which means that productivity shock, it is bound to increase the employment in the economy. It is bound to have the better scenario of wages and that is what we try to understand with the labor market or total factor productivity or real business cycle school of economic thought. So, overall what came out, so they also emphasize with the data that if they can predict with the data that whether it is working or not, what they found that consumption became pro-cyclical investment became pro-cyclical, employment became pro-cyclical, real wage became pro-cyclical and average labor productivity became pro-cyclical. But there are certain dimensions that are worth understanding in case of um, uh, uh, real business cycle school and which are also some of the shortcomings of this model. So, I hope it has made you understand that how the productivity shock can create a favorable scenario in the economy without thinking about the role of government. Government is not playing any role here. It is all about flexible wages and prices with the change in productivity shock, how much you have adjustment in wages and prices and how much it is leading to increase in all other macroeconomic variables, whether it is consumption, whether it is investment and whether it is employment. If it is increasing all, it is good for the economy and it will stabilize the output, it will also create favorable scenarios. And moreover here the money supply increase, it is more or less has to deal with the, with the price adjustment. So, here it is becoming uh, really important to look at that how money supply it is getting translated into the 
uh, into the current and future consumption of the household and how the expectation is playing a dedicated role. So, I will stop here and we will start from here the next session. So, thank you, thank you so much.